2020 was a stress test for almost every company and almost every business. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Daimler team worldwide for uh, helping us mastering this uh, uh, very unusual pandemic. We have a very strong product portfolio and we worked significantly on the cost side. Of course, this was a new situation. So agility, flexibility, and I would say creativity uh, were the things that were demanded from us. And, and very quickly, we could change processes, change the way we work to keep the business going. And we also learned from the different countries around the world where the pandemic hit us first. We took those learnings and moved those to other markets. So we were well prepared uh, when, uh, when the pandemic spread around the world. We're increasing the dividend this year from 90 cents last year to a euro 35 cents this year. And we have a very clear dividend policy. We pay out 40% of net income, that is our rule, and it needs to be covered by the cash flow. We will see the economy gradually opening up again. As the vaccine rollout uh, picks up pace, uh, we think the economy will also pick up pace. So we're looking at a year with very strong pro product portfolio, launch of new products, four new electric cars. Uh, so this is, a, this is a year that we really want to take it to the next level. The 2020 European uh, CO2 fleet targets were very tough. Uh, but we came below those targets and this was thanks to a very strong product portfolio of battery electric vehicles but also attractive plug-in hybrids that were high in demand. Uh, now we intend to build upon that momentum and increase our so-called XEV share even more uh, and we are firmly committed to meeting the targets in 2021 as well. We want to create two very strong pure play industrial leaders. One for luxury passenger cars and a global champion for commercial vehicles, trucks and buses. And there are three aspects that we're looking at. Customer dedication, entrepreneurship and value creation. And as the industry is in transformation, now is the perfect time to do this and let these companies be more agile and pick up speed. Well, for most people, actually, they're already working in this structure, so not much will change. But there are some functions in the headquarters or in our mobility and financial services division where we're going to divide the team and dedicate part of it to the passenger car side and part of it to the commercial vehicle side. So if there are technologies on the one or the other side that is interesting, yes, we can of course continue to cooperate on that as well, even if we are two separate industrial businesses. Globally, if we look at the markets on, on the chart, we see a significant increase in almost all major car markets. Uh, and also I mean, a strong recovery I mean, in the truck market. So uh, maybe in, in the Chinese market segment is only slight increase as we had such a strong 2020. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not a sign of weakness. It's just uh, the matter of fact that 2020 was already so strong. Uh, looking at the group KPIs uh, for 2021, uh, uh, definitely we expect the recovery of the economy having a very favorable positive stimulus on our, our business uh, and further fueling in the high demand uh, for our fantastic products. Uh, that should translate into an increase, a significant increase on the revenue side as well as on the EBIT side at uh, the group level. Uh, we expect, I mean, this is group uh, EBIT reported to be significantly in excess of 2020 obviously in a form of operational performance to which we come in in a second but also supported uh, by the uh, envisaged by the planned closing of the fuel cell joint venture uh, with Volvo which will provide I mean a capital gain uh, in 2021. In the second half I mean related to the envisaged spin-off of the truck group 
Uh, we do expect some significant positive impact, impacts, however, today we cannot determine that. Uh, now, uh, on the free cash flow, really I'd like to explain that, as when you see free cash flow uh, significantly below 2021, you might wonder. Um, so let's go through that. Operationally, in terms of cash flow performance, i.e. the cash flow before interest uh, and the tax adjusted, 2021 will be at same level as 2020. 2020, where the cash conversion rate means significantly above one, 1 1.2 for cars, 2 for trucks. Uh, in 2021, we will be in our target corridor, which means uh, all in all close to one. So cash flow before interest and tax adjusted will be at the same level. However, cash taxes you saw before were pretty low in 2020. And so here we'll be back in higher cash tax zone in 2021, which will take the free cash flow down. And then in the cash flow reported, uh, we will have in the payments uh, in, in the context of the settlement with US regulators in, and the civil law proceedings related uh, to diesel emissions, uh, which we sized uh, at uh, more than 2 billion uh, when we announced it in, uh, uh, in the third quarter. Um, so I hope that gives you some color on the free cash flow. What does it mean in terms of uh, investments, uh, PPE and uh, R&D? Uh, PPE will stay at about I mean, the same level uh, like with 2020. R&D will go up slightly. We will invest into the key strategic fields Ola highlighted, MBOS, the NVIDIA Corporation, electric drive um, to uh, prepare for, for the future. Uh, all in all, however, as emphasized before, we will definitely stick to our midterm targets as outlined during the Mercedes-Benz main strategy update. And on CO2, as Ola highlighted already before, in 2021, it will be significantly below the comparable figure, now switching over to WLTP as a new norm. Uh, and that means uh, that in 2020, uh, that number will sit significantly below, uh, 2021 will sit significantly below. And how do we get there? By almost doubling the number of XEV sales in 2021 over 2020. Looking at the divisional performance uh, targets uh, for uh, 2021, for, for cars, we see them significantly above a prior year. Uh, that is a function of the market recovering but also a function of a very, very strong product portfolio in 2021. Again, S-Class, EQS coming up, EQA, uh, the, 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 full, the full power uh, and uh, portfolio at work. Uh, and when I say significantly, I'd like to remind you that that means in excess of 7.5% year on year. So we are, what we said in the 6th of October, in the kind of a call it half sun or fair weather conditions in uh, 2021. Uh, we do assume, as I said, uh, to recover from the semiconductor situation uh, in the remainder of the year. However, it will impact them in, in the first quarter. The vans will have a slight increase in the, in the unit sales. Uh, on the truck side, we see a significant increase, in particular thanks to North America, Europe, but also Indonesia. Now, if you look at the returns of sales adjusted uh, on uh, cars and vans, we do expect 8 to 10 percent on an adjusted basis return on sales. How do we get there? A positive momentum, which I outlined on the volume on the product side with a very favorable mix with a strong pricing and the continuation of our cost and efficiency measures uh, into 2021. We will face on the other side uh, some headwinds. On the FX side, on raw materials, we'll have a bit of a step up uh, in the in the R&D. Uh, the the almost doubling of the XEV comes along also with a slight mean dilution. Uh, on the other side, we'll have a, a bit of a tailwind from uh, the extension of useful lives, as we reviewed uh, how long can we use our equipments and tools. Uh, we, we now convinced that we can use them longer and that means the depreciation will be lower. That will support the EBIT 
in 2021 at the group level by 800 million, the majority of that falling into the cars and vans segment. On the cash side, um, uh, overall at the group level, I explained already before. So what does it mean for the cash flow before interest and tax uh, at uh, cars and vans? The target of 0.7 to 0.9, so slightly below one. Why a bit of working capital as we are ramping up, I mean, uh, significantly as outlined before, uh, and this depreciation impact obviously is non-cash. On the trucks and buses, we expect 6 to 7% return on sales adjusted. A significant volume boost uh, will help. A stronger mix from a heavy duty segment in North America and in Europe. We'll continue our efficiency measures. On the other side, we have a bit of uh, FX uh, headwind uh, also over here. So when we say 6 to 7%, that reflects me in the overall balance of uh, risk and opportunities. And Martin, I think we can say maybe we see it rather at the higher end in terms of this guidance range than at the lower end. Uh, good continued discipline also on the, on the cash conversion side in trucks, 0.8 to 1. Uh, that ramp up obviously requires also a bit of working capital and a bit of a step up in the invest. And at the DMO, we target uh, th 12 to 13 percent return on equity adjusted. Here we do assume some continued impact uh, from uh, the COVID-19 situation in terms of the, the macroeconomics, uh, uh, hence on the cost of credit risk, something we're going to watch certainly throughout uh, 2021. So far from my side and with this, back to Yola. So to Thank you very much, uh, Martin. <clears throat> well, so let's have a look at uh, Daimler Mobility. I mean, obviously, uh, COVID-19 impacted uh, Daimler Mobility I mean, a lot on uh, the existing portfolio. And the priority definitely was uh, to help our customers through that very difficult uh, period uh, in 2020. And we'll continue to do so uh, for sure uh, with swift and flexible financing solutions. And we're definitely convinced but uh, that will pay back in terms of customer loyalty and uh, retention. Second one, obviously, to continue to support I mean, cars and uh, trucks uh, for new sales. So again, every second uh, vehicle I mean, delivered got supported uh, by smart financing and leasing. At the same time, we continued I mean, the full effort to digitalize I mean, the business on the customer front, on online services, up to credit decisions, i.e. automating credit decisions. And COVID as well made it uh, that we went even stronger on the break in terms of cost discipline and uh, cost saving measures. That means uh, the OPEX developed very favorable. And that means uh, that even in a year of COVID-19, the cost income ratio improved further at the uh, Daimler Mobility. The macroeconomic circumstances made it that we had uh, to adjust our credit risk provision in, in the first half. However, we could flatten that out in the second half, in particular in quarter four. So if we look at um, in the key KPIs, well, the new business I mean, uh, came, uh, came down by 9%. Towards the year end, however, it stabilized again. The total contract volume, the portfolio I mean, decreased uh, by 8% to 150 billion, uh, of which basically the volume adjustment is 3%, the remainder is FX. And on the EBIT side, uh, uh, EBIT decreased, EBIT adjusted decreased by 1.6 billion uh, to 10.9% uh, uh, return on equity adjusted. Let's have a look at that walk I and mean, how we got there. Uh, well, the key impact, I mean, as we can see on the chart, comes uh, from the higher credit risk provision. It's a credit risk provision, as you know. Uh, that means uh, uh, to, uh, we have to cater for the potential risk related to credit, uh, given the, the macroeconomic I mean, volatility in uh, 2020. That happened chiefly in the first half of the year. Uh, and no further increase was required I mean, in quarter four. <clears throat> uh, I really would like, like to emphasize that the net credit losses, i.e. the actual net credit losses, are still well below the long-term average. And then we worked on, uh, on cost efficiencies. Well, you don't see it completely as in the volume margin, 
there is an impairment uh, on uh, software in the context of uh, the streamlining of our IT portfolio. Without that, I mean, that would be uh, in the positive territory. And then overall, uh, you see the, uh, the beneficial impact uh, from our cost efforts also at the DMO level, improving uh, the uh, cost income ratio, as I, as I said uh, before. Uh, also, I mean, a number in there, which looks a bit uh, tiny, but I think it's a pretty remarkable result. Uh, in the other section, 60 million improvement year on year coming from the mobility services. Uh, you know that has been impacted I mean, severely uh, in 2020 as well. Uh, I mean, the guys over there in free now, in share now, uh, charge parking, uh, did also, I think, a great job I mean, to adjust in terms of market practice as well as on the, on the cost side. A big thanks to them also. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the group level in terms of uh, EBIT evolution, uh, well, I mean, the key things that we explained already before, the divisional performance, uh, so uh, the year-on-year -year decrease in EBIT adjusted uh, at DMO and uh, trucks uh, could not be completely overcompensated by the year-on-year -year improvement on the passenger car and, and the van side. Uh, uh, other than that, I mean, I would just like I mean, to, to mention I mean, the, the adjustments which we had to record in the full year with 2 billion, definitely significantly lower than 2019. And uh, the key ones uh, are associated uh, to the restructuring program, the, the personal cost reduction program, the move program by 900 million, and the capacity adjustment at cars and vans, as I mentioned uh, before. If we look at the cash flow statement, uh, basically uh, uh, we saw all of the key explanations I mean, before. Uh, in summary, at the group level, I mean, we see that from a pretty decent cash from operations, we had a benefit uh, from the working capital, um, and, uh, and that makes, I mean, altogether um, uh, a good contribution uh, from uh, the, the cash flow before interest and tax. Then, I mean, we had cash taxes uh, of uh, 800 million, so a pretty low level, and that made, I mean, 8.3 and on an uh, adjusted basis, uh, 9.2, uh, basically what is in between in the adjustments, uh, cash out associated uh, to field measures on diesel vehicles. We look at the evolution of uh, the net industrial liquidity. We started the year, I mean, with 11 billion. You see uh, the, the, the strong cash from operations at the group level, I mean, uh, 2.5 billion of uh, favorable working capital evolution, which we commented before, and then overall, I mean, the balance between the investments uh, and uh, the depreciation. After the dividend of a billion, which we paid in July, that leaves us uh, with a very, very solid 18 billion net cash. Um, I, I was very pleased to see recently that Standard & Poor's revised their outlook on Daimler from negative to stable. I hope others will follow soon. That leaves us again with 18 billion of a net cash balance, uh, we, and obviously that leaves us or gives us a lot of uh, financial flexibility. Now let's have a look at uh, what to do with the net result. I mean, the net result uh, reached 4 billion. Uh, so we looked at the EBIT adjusted uh, before, uh, so down to 4 billion. What is in between, basically? Uh, the, the tax rate, the effective tax rate, which is uh, a bit higher here at 37% I mean, in 2020. That is a, a function of some evaluation allowances on deferred taxes and some expenses which have been non-deductible. Moving forward, however, you should continue to apply a group rate, tax group rate uh, between 28 and 30%. Looking at the dividend proposal, um, the management uh, board and the supervisory board um, in proposes to the ABG, EAGM a dividend of 135 euro per share. That is uh, applying our dividend policy of 40% uh, on the net income, uh, eligible mean for the Daimler shareholders. Um, uh, that is obviously supported by the cash flow in 2020. Well, that is supported by the cash flow in 2021, that is supported by our positive business outlook, which you 
uh, see in this presentation. With this, I hand back to you, Ola. Thank you, Harold. Thank